So let's begin with a couple of you know, a couple of minutes of looking forward into the future. So as you probably know, GPUs are pretty cool. Uh, we rely on them pretty heavily for our pretty pixels and games, but more recently, the tech world has been kind of fawning over the very high power, cheap processing of the GPU. And they're cropping up more and more in modern technology, uh, driving your, you know, the self-driving car revolution, driving neural nets and AI and data centers, and generally just being much faster than the traditional CPU. But there's also another area where GPUs have kind of been uh, quite an important development. Um, so as you probably know, that uh, blockchains and Bitcoin and Ethereum have kind of been a thing recently. Uh, they're part of the reason why I can't buy cheap graphics cards anymore, because everyone keeps on buying them up. Um, but, you know, blockchains have also been an interesting technological development because they kind of provide some interesting insights into how we can do things like trust-based computing. You know, enabling trust between untrusted peers over a gigantic network. And generally just a model for distributed self-structuring applications. Uh, but not all the recent developments of interest have been solely in kind of non-gaming spaces. Some of you guys might know about a company that recently got funded by SoftBank called Impolable, and they make a platform called Spatial OS. And what the Spatial OS guys are trying to do is kind of break through the traditional MMO model and provide a multiplayer kind of cloud infrastructure architecture and system that allows us to completely try to allow developers to completely break through traditional scaling problems and also provide software and architecture that will dynamically scale across whatever resources are available on their systems. Another kind of big development for the game industry in particular but is kind of leaking into other aspects of technology. It's kind of a democratized game development ecosystem that game engines like Unity and Unreal Engine have been enabling for us. You know, anyone with the time can pick up some really powerful tools like Unreal Engine and Unity and Blender and kind of just start making a game and see where that kind of leads them, which has kind of been very powerful and disruptive to technology markets. And kind of in general, there's just been a whole host of developments that are generally just improving our lives. So VR is, well, for a lot of people, seems like a gimmick. I am personally interested in how VR can change the way that we interact with computers. Uh, you know, technology in general just keeps on getting better and better. You know, NVIDIA makes faster GPUs, Intel and a whole bunch of other storage companies have been figuring out how to make storage faster and solve a lot of problems at a very low level. So where does this all kind of build up to? Well, each time I try to do this metaphor, it gets a little bit better and better. I'll try my best today. So a lot of technology is kind of building towards breaking away old centralized models and building up apps that are just to be resilient and self-organizing. So you could kind of picture our exascale future as a living organism that grows, develops, evolves, and adapts to its environment, which in this case is market pressure and available resources, to kind of be the self-organizing, self-structuring system that dynamically adapts to faults, errors, hardware available, things like that. So, where does this kind of come into for my day job? Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, where Darius spun out from, which is the SKA project. <coughs> so for who, whoever doesn't know it yet, the SKA project is a huge worldwide initiative to build the world's biggest telescope, basically, with two main antenna sites in um, Australia and South Africa. And basically the SKA system is one of the world's biggest IT initiatives with huge cooperation between various countries and a gigantic budget. And Mary in particular are currently partnered with the radio astronomers in Australia, uh, known as ICRA, to help them kind of build the platform and the architecture to actually enable software processing at the scale, which is known as the SKA SDP. Uh, at the moment, our main project with them is just solving the storage problems, which in, the, in themselves are immense. 
but we also look at longer term things like how to take existing data center infrastructure and just really utilize it towards its strength. So to give you some of the ideas of the problems that I am trying to tackle on a day-to-day -day basis in my architecture design, I'll just go quickly through a lot of problems that games also experience, but also the kind of things that uh, the science community is experiencing. So one of the main challenges with the SKA today is that the raw input from the antennas is one exabyte per day. And we need to process all of this data without losing it. We need to process all of this data in real time. And we had to process this data on traditional, or more traditional um, IT infrastructure, and not, and not only that, but utilize it to its most efficient, at the sort of maximum efficiency. And the planned SDA supercomputers are basically 100 million times the power of current classical computers, which is a lot of toys to play with. There's also some other more complex challenges that aren't so obvious at first. So one of the issues with computation and simulation of the scale is that errors become a huge problem. So anyone here who's done multiplayer gaming knows all about the issues with gameplay when simulations diverge and the clients and servers start disagreeing with each other. Well, this is compounded in the scientific community where errors accumulate in the simulation and the actual end result is useless and they need to try it out again. There's also some more subtle issues such as um, once we've processed some data and stored it, they need to be able to trust the fact that a bit didn't flip while it was in storage, and that the hardware itself didn't actually error while it was running. There's also kind of a softer challenge, which is uh, the main kind of user base for the SKA is uh, scientists, and they're not programmers, and a lot of their old code is written in Fortran, um, which generally makes supporting and maintaining code a bit difficult. But it's not only trying to make this huge, massive system be friendly to non-programmers, it's also trying to make it friendly for the IT administrators who have to maintain these massive data centers. And if they want to expose all this data to the public, have the user interface schemes that are friendly for your end user to kind of explore the galaxy. So what I want to get into now is kind of talk about how Mary in particular and my team are kind of approaching architecture ideas to solve these problems. So, Nerea so, is heavily influenced by real-time gaming tech. A lot of you know, the executives and a lot of my colleagues have gaming backgrounds. And in a lot of ways, our platform is heavily influenced by existing game engine architecture. But, ultimately, what we're building is in a game engine. And while there is a lot of things that apply, there's also a lot of areas where Game engines are just kind of been falling behind the general hardware capabilities. And I would love to clarify that, which is the rest of this talk. So there's some pretty obvious reasons for why this kind of trend has been occurring. You know, a less focus on pushing the latest pretty pixels, because scaling up art that way is uneconomical, and just a general tendency of the market to start targeting indie developers and small scale projects, which means that there's less pressure on its gaming developers to really innovate in particular spaces. So with that in mind, I want to go over three kind of architectural areas where Nerian is trying to bring software back to the kingpin. And the three main areas are basically huge parallel compute, <coughs> fast storage, and distributed networking and applications. So, Every year, it seems like the games industry has this talk. Oh my god, guys, shooting is hard and it's getting worse. But this time, we're kind of staring on the barrel of a slightly different beast. Where before people were worrying about dual core and quad core processors, but now we're looking on the barrel of CPUs having 32 threads or 32 cores, or in the data center space, 8 cores <coughs> with 8 simultaneous threads, and in the case of IBM's power ecosystem. And we're also entering an interesting space where our mobile phone processor, such as the Tegra platform, has more actual cores than my desktop computer. And we're not entirely sure how to take advantage of all of it. And on top of that, we've got G4 
GPUs, uh, Nereid's favorite computation platform, which are continuously growing in size, and the new NVIDIA Volta architecture is actually starting to question our GPU, game, uh, GPU programming best practices. So, part of our architecture at Nereid is that we're kind of questioning the kind of approach that people take to doing multi-threaded programming. So I just want to start a bit with a little of kind of our ancestry of technology. So obviously a lot of game development has been driven by what the hardware was available. So our very early games were single-threaded applications because it was one core. And not only that, they had to be very conscious of timing because the CPUs are not particularly fast. And in the case of very early game engines, the CPU not only had to do the simulation, but the graphics, and the sound, and everything else. And this kind of led to code that was pretty counterintuitive when you think about it today in a lot of cases. It led to architectures where time happens, and then a bunch of things happen. So time happens, and we start generating a new frame. So we do our normal things with integrated state, but we also do things of checking you know, doing decision making and then applying those time changes in real time. And this has kind of led to an architecture where it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine and you can very easily end up with sequences where you start with very simple high level decision making and then you're lost in lines and lines and lines of code doing particular statistics and there doesn't seem to have a very good reason for it. But if we fast forward, 10, 20 or so years, we have what a lot of people turned at the time the multi-core revolution. And this was basically when consumer CPUs started having more than one core by default, even though this kind of existed in the server space for a long time up until that point. And we generally, you know, we kind of rushed out to take advantage of it. And the main approach that a lot of game studios took um, in particular, I'm thinking of Bungie's and the Dog game engine when I say this. We turn to things like task parallelism to kind of try to take advantage of these calls as much as possible, or in the case of the Naughty Dog engine, also pipelining. And this generally had some success, albeit with the cost of a lot of complexity, but there were kind of a couple of issues with this kind of nimby task parallelism architecture. You know, for example, it's actually quite hard to scale your maximum amount of parallelism is actually dictated by the amount of parallel data dependencies that you have. Sorry, not even data dependencies, sorry, task dependencies. And the actual framework for managing the threading underneath in the architecture is actually quite complicated and can lead to a lot of bugs. There is another reason why we're kind of skeptical of this approach, which is at Nereid, we're kind of preparing for a world where you have servers and data centers packed with GPUs, all connected to each other in a fully connected grid. Uh, for example, if you have Power 8 MP link system, we for every like six to eight core CPU, you have a lot lots of the side, tons of simultaneous threads. And then you have these huge powerful P100 GPUs with 20 or so SMs each, tons of parallel SIMD CUDA cores, fully connected to each other in a high bandwidth bus. And one thing that we've found or discovered is that the kind of traditional approach to MIMDI really doesn't work in this kind of architecture. So, so we've made a couple of observations in the lifetime of the um, startup, but probably the best analogy for us for now is to kind of study an old, an old kind of system called Conway Scan of Life. So for, for who? Doesn't know yet. Conway's Game of Life is just a cellular automata algorithm that will simulate virtual life um, on the computer. But the Game of Life has some interesting properties. For, uh, the main one I'm interested for here today is that every single cell in the Game of Life can be updated in parallel. And it does the exact same operation. And this maps extremely well to the GPU and kind of gives some insight into, the, into how we can maybe do very large simulations on the GPU completely in parallel. And kind of the main insight Gamma Life has for us is that 
it doesn't have an intermediate state, and it doesn't have a mutable in-place state. So in the game of life, everything is read only, and everything happens simultaneously, massively in parallel, and then you write the results to the new frame. And this, if we can kind of capture this model in a more general computer architecture, we can kind of write code that will map very well to clusters of GPUs. So just to kind of illustrate how this might work in a more general architecture, uh, we kind of have, instead of thinking of our simulation as time happens, therefore something happened, we go, stuff happens, therefore time occurred. And kind of how you code this is, you have a reference frame, and this picture is frame zero, of the, and it, of the state of the system at a point in time. We massively in parallel read that state, and then based off what the state actually is, we write forward new transactions that modify the state of the system. And so in general, we kind of have a frame up that step that looks like this, where from frame zero, we produce a bunch of transactions that apply atomically, and that happen simultaneously and in real time, and then the system assembles those into a snapshot that we call a frame. And that kind of leads to a processing pipeline that kind of looks like this. So we start from an initial frame, we step it, we generate all the transactions and resolve them together into the independent states, and then we snapshot that into the new frame. Now the really interesting observation from this is that the data parallelism isn't limited by dependencies, it's limited by the number of independent states that you have to track. There is a consequence of going with this kind of high level design though, if we were parallel computation, and that's when transactions conflict. So regardless of the downsides of kind of that task dependency system, the fact that you manage dependencies means that you could make sure that your code was free of state of that conflicts. But when we have transactions that apply in parallel and simultaneously, those two transactions can conflict. For example, you could have code that revives a character while they die, and it's not entirely clear what state you should resolve that character to. And there's kind of a couple of techniques that you can do to resolve this. So people from kind of a database programming world have some old idiom called ACID, which is basically the easiest way to think of it is that a transaction applies or it doesn't. Uh, those who are familiar with the multitude of programming world might be familiar with atomics and compare and swap, where everything races to do a state update and only one person wins and the other three can either try again or continue doing something else. From kind of the Hadoop world and also kind of the graphics programming world, you might be familiar with transactional reduction. So an example of this in the games programming world is your depth buffer, where your entire pixel shader races against each other, and then you reduce the final pixels inside the depth buffer. And the more general approach that Naria takes and a lot of distributed systems actually take is what's called consensus resolution, where there's actually an algorithm that looks at all the state updates and decides what the final state should be. So now that we've kind of got an idea on how we can maybe scale all this computation, we need to actually load data to process it. So who has kind of heard of AMD's new Radeon Pro SSG graphics card? Sweet, one person. So for those who don't know, um, this is a graphics card that AMD has released or will release soon. I forget which one. It basically has a hard drive on the back of it. Um, and it puts about one to two terabyte of storage directly on the GPU. Now this is a really interesting piece of hardware for me in particular, because it means you can do kind of weird things when you load a data set onto the GPU. Um, AMD intended this for video processing, 3D, kind of 3D processing. But I know this, I think, a lot of things like we can take our entire game assets, load them up into the GPU quickly, and just simultaneously load the world because we have one terabyte of memory that's really close. Um, or if you want to extend that further, take your entire game simulation and your program and just chuck it all on the GPU on one load set. But unfortunately, 
we still have to live in a world of traditional IL and traditional IO architectures. And it's not very hard to see you know, the limitations that it brings. So obviously the console games world has been using spinning disks for a long time, and this has only really changed recently in different architectures. Whereas the personal computer and a lot of other older systems had hard drives, but they all kind of had the same consequence where the I.O. was so slow that we had to write a bunch of architecture to deal with that. And usually this comes up uh, under the very broad term of resource management architecture. But you can kind of, this kind of encapsulates probably all the things you're all familiar with, like worlds, managing caching, having references to resources which might be paged off the disk, and just general bad, horrible, disgusting, ugly code that just deals with the fact that the, everything we care about is on these very slow I.O. meetings. <coughs> so, to kind of get some insight on how we might move, we'll start moving away from this, uh, John Carmack loves ranting, if you haven't noticed. Um, and he's got a very particularly good rant on about why the hell don't we just page stuff directly to the judge we get. And it's a very good talk. Uh, Ray, I recommend reading it on his Facebook. But basically, he's going, why can't we just get the GP to load everything directly? The old way is slow, the old way has security flaws. Why has it someone just spilled up to the plate and made it so the GP can manage its own resources? And the kinds of, of observation he's making kind of come from the data center world again, where they kind of got hyped into what's called storage class memories. So storage class memories are basically consistent storage that's faster than the existing flash techniques, but still slower by DRAM by a factor of a thousand, but they're still plenty fast for managing a simulation at 60 frames per second. And storage class memories are making their way into the consumer space. You might know them know it as Intel Optane today. And storage class memories are kind of invalidating a lot of assumptions people have been making about um, storage in relation to computation, right? These memories run at gigs and gigs a second. The latency is a lot slower compared to old storage. This completely reshapes the relative performance of your entire system stack. And in general, at least in the enterprise space, no one really seems to be prepared for how it's going to change their software architecture. So, to quickly summarize Carmack's solution in a picture, um, which you can come to me today if you want to mess around with a video or AMD. And so the limits kernel is basically you take your modern GPU that has very nice, efficient virtual memory and paging systems, you basically take your storage and you map your assets into your memory thread space, which is managed by the CPU. And so when the so then you pass the entire map region to the GPU. When the GPU needs to access resources, if it's not there, the CPU just pages to the storage, loads it in, and the GPU continues. <coughs> Unfortunately, I can't completely agree with Carmack's thesis here. And the reason for that is basically, it still kind of makes, the CPU still controls the entire storage pipeline in this scenario. When the GPU pages, not only does the CPU have to handle the interrupts in the page table for paging, it has to manage the file system and actually do a read. And there's kind of other consequences of this faster memory that this um, design is entirely taken into account. So one of the consequences of storage class memories is that caching has less of an effect now. And because these devices are so fast, we actually have to burn a ton of CPU time just to fill out the I.O. queues and get the maximum performance from these devices. And in general, using the GPU and CPU in this way is kind of a fundamental architecture change to current operating systems. Because at the moment, most operating systems assume the CPU is the center of the world and the GPU, if it exists at all, is a pretty thing to render media. There's a couple of other issues I kind of have um, that kind of make this a bad solution for me. So one of the issues I have with these kind of page architecture designs, even though they are convenient, is that it shuts a bunch of performance control into the operating system. 
and we don't we can't really tweak that directly. And kind of in general, when discussing you know these external third party dividers and other CPU, they're all behind the PCI Express bus, which tends to be very limited on CPUs today. Nary lives in a world where this is not surprising. So this is what drove in a box. It's about a 70 SSD array. And over here is about three hard drive controllers and a GPU that controls all the storage and does all the math and generally makes sure that it can access array data. So in a world where Myriad in particular is kind of developing towards where this is a normal thing, how will we actually solve this GPU IO problem properly? One observation we've made is that if you live in a workstation world, and we don't mind paying like five grand for GPU. Um, NVIDIA already has a very powerful peer-to-peer I.O. system that can do very fast transfers between two GPUs. So we went, why not just replace those GPUs with I.O. devices and directly DMA between external devices. So when the GPU needs to communicate with storage or communicate with the network, instead of going through the CPU and getting the CPU to micromanage everything, the GPU just uses its powerful DMA engines to directly grab data at 8 meters a second or to directly send network packets or receive them from the network. And this generally has a better performance. That's where we want to, uh, like a team kind of working on this problem today. And we've already seen performance benefits from the traditional model where the transfer between GPU and NVMe has about a half to a third of the latency of traditional CPU pipeline. And the power of this idea, at least for Nereid, expands some more when we start to consider how data centers are going to architect themselves, where instead of relying on lots and lots and lots of independent servers, we have less servers that have a lot of external devices between switch, behind switches, which greatly scale the amount of storage or computation resources that are available per node. So instead of having one CPU trying to manage all these devices, we just have the devices talk directly to each other using the GPU as an intermediary. So if we can have these large data centers that can manage their own computation, and they can also manage their own storage, how do we actually write distributed applications to take advantage of all this? So I'm not gonna go a huge amount into current MMO kind of distribution techniques. There are plenty of good existing tools on how a lot of companies architect this already. But the kind of general overview is that at the moment, a lot of studios rely on some kind of authoritative model, some kind of you know, spatial partitioning to try to divide up computation resources. <coughs> so, excuse me. Or they might rely on types of instancing to kind of distribute players between um, different servers. You might have world servers like the RuneScape and Guild Wars, and you might have clever world idling techniques to make sure you're not simulating the resources you don't need to. And this kind of has a lot of gameplay consequences. It kind of limits the scale of these MMOs, and then some of them have quite uh, observable effects for the player. So at the moment, I'm personally playing a bit of Guild Wars 2, and there's a couple of cases where this instancing problem actually affects my gameplay, where I'll try to teleport to the same server as a player, but I actually ended up going on a different instance. And there were some cases where I'm playing the game, and the game comes up to me and says, hey, this server has a long amount of players, do you want to change server? And I personally find it very weird and for a game like Guild Wars or RuneScape, well, you know, walk around, why wouldn't we want to scale the worlds to be as large as they can since they're actually a selling point of the game? So, in the viewers' talk, I kind of mentioned Spatial OS. I just want to briefly dive into um, kind of how they're scaling this up and decoupling a lot of these concepts. So, at the top layer of the Spatial OS stack, this is a kind of a glossing over some of the details, but they have the concept of the worker, where the worker has authority and manages a small segment of the game world. It's kind of like spatial partitioning, but there's more complexity to it. It's more of a consensus process. That gets mapped down to the actual logical game world, um, which might be running on different engine simulations, 
uh, or different engine versions, and then that gets mapped down to an actual physical data center. But that's actually not the approach Nero is taking. We're more interested in the kind of minimalism <coughs> blockchains have to teach and how we can apply them into a more general computation architecture. So Bitcoin is interesting as it is at the moment, has a very few core technical ideas that we find to be quite powerful. But the main one is mostly how it can kind of reduce a bunch of extremely parallel work to finding a number. So for those who don't know, Bitcoin is based off the proof of work hash, where all the nodes submit their uh, finance transactions, and then miners are in a race to not only verify all the data, but provide a proof that they actually processed everything, which is captured as this number. And there's a couple of observations to be made from kind of how the system works. So Tim Sweeney has been kind of considering this problem in the game industry space for a little while, if you follow him on Twitter. And he's kind of made some observations about how blockchains have this idea of in parallel building up these state trees and how this parallel process uh, kind of has this evolutionary aspect to it where the network itself adapts to the load and its topology. Um, and why can't we utilize this today to do the same thing for our games? So to kind of get an overview of how the Nereo blockchain model works, so this is a little lesson in how Bitcoin works, and kind of a Nereo blockchain model, we have individual blocks that nodes create in parallel. Um, these are individual state updates in the network. So this could be a player died, a player did some attack, then an attack, or it could be a game client clicked on a particular item. In the case of general computation, this could be this computation happened. So it is quite a general concept. And then throughout the entire network, different nodes are collecting up these individual state updates and assembling them into a state snapshot called the Google block. And then those Google blocks define what we normally call a frame, which is the state of the system at a particular point in time. Then the Nereo blockchain model takes a step further and does something similar to Ethereum, but we implement it quite differently, where instead of hard coding this entire process, we have the entire thing defined by scriptable contracts to have kind of this general programmable global state management system. So what does kind of an architecture look like when you apply this at scale? Well, I first want to start with some of its consequences because we can build up what it looks like from that. So in this model where you assemble transactions together, there isn't really a concept of time to create reality like with those traditional simulations. Stuff has to happen in the network to make the system progress. So we have to write relativistic programs that work based off causality and interactions instead of having to um, rely on the fact that time is a particular step. Uh, kind of another side effect is that um, since it is a network and it's distributed and we just remove the global clock, everything really does happen asynchronously and it does cause problems and it does require some counterintuitive thinking, much in the same way Einsteinian relativity has some kind of counterintuitive aspects to it. Since this is a parallel system now, um, we also think about state differently. So in a normal authoritative model that you might be familiar with game simulations, you have a small set of servers that is the actual authoritative game simulation. Clients connect to it, and in the case of the lock state model, the client waits for confirmation from the server for absolutely everything, including user input, if it affects the game state. Um, and this leads to an interesting scenario where when you take that away, games or simulations or whatever your logical universe, you only have to resolve issues or conflicts when consensus is actually required. If 
two different gamers or clients or servers are going to end up wanting to see the same thing. These the steps to make sure that they're valid with each other happens as needed. Otherwise, they don't care, right? The server doesn't care in the game world what happens on the outside of the game map um, when I, you know, in a hole somewhere. So, what does kind of the game simulation network look like when you apply this model? So, usually you design these things top down, but I'm going to explain them bottom up because it leads for more intuitive understanding. So let's assume we have some game clients that simultaneously exist in the same game world. So what, and they're all simulating and having consensus amongst themselves. And so what kind of things are they having consensus over? Well, a lot of the times that's just visual effects, right? If it's snowing in the game world, the game client is the only one who cares where a particular snowflake is because it doesn't really affect gameplay. And it's a very local process. But what happens when there are things that affect gameplay? Well, in a, in a server authoritative model, you will just have one consistent game simulation that has control over everything. But in the blockchain model, that's not actually necessarily the required process. When there are conflicts that can affect consistent, uh, consistence and consensus, instead of thinking of it in terms of here's your authority, the game clients, if you want a truly peer-to-peer -peer model, can simultaneously assemble with each other into a network, get consistency with each other with what happened in the physics simulation, and decide how the game state was affected. And this, you'll notice this is a more abstract model. So the game clients work in a very real thing that the players can interact with, but this higher level authority from the network is a bit more abstract. And we can kind of push that logic further and further, where, you know, a lot of physics can happen, but it doesn't necessarily affect the player's progress through the game or their kind of game state. So we could have the physics authorities in the network, which might be the clients working together or servers that the studio controls, and again assemble together into a higher authority that's even more abstract called the trust authority. And all that does is make sure that there's consistency between things like game rewards or the quest progress of individual players. So you'll notice that this model kind of leads to a scenario where you have this graph network of interactions. You have a lot of data processing at kind of the outer levels with a lot of independent network, uh, sorry, running independently of the network. And then the network forms abstract layers with less and less data processing until you get to the center where there's actually not very much happening at all, and it's very abstract. So this is an example taken from a security analysis called Austin Taylor. It's not actually talking about blockchains, but it's a very powerful image of what they end up looking like. Where on the other edges, you have all the individual clients kind of doing their own thing, and then as the data gets processed more and more in the network, it kind of condenses into a center authority that is actually making, and this authority is actually built up from multiple machines in the case of a truly peer-to-peer system that kind of has the most um, concrete state of the system. And so in the case of gaming, you could view this in kind of a more traditional model where the, you know, the studios have the authority of the servers that they manage, they trust them, then they push out their trust to the clients. But you can also view this in the opposite way. For example, the SKA, where data is coming in from the telescopes and it gets processed more and more as it flows through the network, becoming more abstract, stripping away data for it, and then it accumulates in a very simple consensus in the center. So, with that, I want to talk very briefly about. If we're expressing this entire series of complex interactions as a network graph, well, why don't we try to take advantage of that and actually have a graph process model? That's what Nuria calls this particular platform that we developed, AmpGraph. And basically, its main goal is to be an exascale graph processing architecture, which is very buzzwordy. Um, 
And it is really influenced a lot by our scientific processing endeavors. Um, but kind of the key differentiating aspects is that we actually have shoot highly simply code of GPUs, FPGAs, and CPUs. And we rely on this blockchain architecture to not only provide networks of computers that simultaneously assemble into each other and into a consistent core. Um, we also utilize cryptographic aspects of the blockchain to provide auditability, reproducibility, debugging, things like that. And if you want, you can help me build it. Uh, so yeah, um, that's all today. Sorry, didn't quite enough time to squeeze everything in. Um, any questions? <laughs>